All right, welcome back. So the title of this mini lecture is the Bracero program, uh, which happened in the early 1940s up until about 1964. So there's a lot to know about it. It's a pretty complex, pretty involved thing, but we're going to talk about five things that you need to know to kind of get into it a little bit. So let's get started. First thing, the concept of the arsenal of democracy was a big deal during World War II and it had a significant role to play across the Americas. All right, so the U.S. enters World War II after December 7th, 1941, the attack by the Japanese uh, against Pearl Harbor. But while the Soviet Union may have been marshalling a lot of their manpower for the war, the Americans are marshalling a lot of their material resources. Uh, so, of course, the American economy is going to be producing a lot, but of course they can't do it themselves uh, alone. They're going to have to rely on a lot of their allies and a lot of their neighbors to provide a lot of the material for this. And so uh, you're going to end up seeing a lot stronger ties develop, new ties developed between the U.S. and a number of, again, their Latin American neighbors. Uh, remember, the Americans will eventually uh, supply the Allies with something like two-thirds to three-quarters of everything that they needed during the war. So we're not talking about a couple of tanks here. Secondly, the creation of the program was influenced by jobs and by the needs of the war. All right, so from the American perspective, right, the reason they want to make a deal with the Mexican government to provide uh, workers to come into the U.S., a sort of guest worker program, they lobby from the perspective of saying, you know, we need men who are normally doing this work to go fight. Uh, could perhaps these Mexican workers come in and could they do this work? Uh, and so that way they can get higher paying jobs and then that way, uh, you know, we can send uh, our soldiers off to fight, right? This is the American way of saying, you know, this is good for everybody. You know, this is going to be a, a good thing. All right. Number three, the Mexican government had valid concerns uh, about why the United States wanted to make the agreement. Let's not kid ourselves. The United States you know, didn't have the greatest relationship with the nation of Mexico. You had the punitive expedition to go after Pancho Villa uh, during the era of the revolution, uh, 1920s, early 1930s. You've got the after effects of the revolution from Mexico. You've got the creation of stronger immigration policies. 1930s, during the Great Depression, you have operations on the part of the federal government in the U.S. to deport uh, individuals who were from Mexico or who were American citizens uh, of Mexican, uh, you know, who had parental lineage of Mexican origin. Uh, so you had real racist policies there. Uh, so there was a great concern on the part of the government of Mexico that many of these workers aren't going to be treated fairly. They're not going to be treated well. Uh, and so this was part of the reason why there was a concern. And you see also the lobbying on the part of the Mexican government for better treatment uh, in the agreement, right, that there would be no discrimination, this kind of thing. All right, number four, the treatment of workers was hard and most of the agreed provisions uh, or many of the agreed provisions were ignored, right? So again, the Mexican government was concerned about their workers, about the kind of treatment that they would be receiving as guest workers in the United States. So obviously they wanted an agreement that enshrined things like no discrimination uh, for these workers, fair pay, fair conditions, this kind of thing. Sadly, most of that is ignored, not only by the United States federal government, but also by many of the growers who are hiring these workers uh, across the U.S. Now, many of the workers for this program, uh, again, this is a, a guest worker agricultural and, and railroad worker program, mostly agricultural worker program, uh, is they're mostly going to be working in places like Texas and California, uh, but they'll be in some other states too. So again, uh, they told them, no, 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 no discrimination. Eh, it lied. Okay, number five. Uh, Braceros endured, and but they suffered lasting effects that we should acknowledge today. So when workers would make their way eventually into the U.S. and would eventually be brought to different sites to then work, right? So you had to go as a worker through a lot of processing. There were medical exams. Uh, they would be uh, sprayed uh, with DDT uh, to supposedly, uh, you know, sort of uh, decontaminate these workers. Uh, and I think generally most folks in the 21st century know that spraying someone with DDT is 
bad. Uh, and, of course, the question of pay, right? So you have many of these men uh, from all across Mexico who give up whatever possibilities of work uh, in their local communities to go up to the U.S. To, to do this work with the thought being that they're going to be able to provide much more for their families as a result of this. Some of that is relatively true. Much of it isn't necessarily. Uh, for example, the Mexican government, the U.S. said uh, they were going to hold on to 10% of the workers' wages, uh, you know, partly the idea that they wouldn't, uh, you know, sort of back out of the program or something like that. But of course, uh, you know, that 10% didn't necessarily make it back into the hands uh, of these workers. All right. Thank you so very much.